Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify, Apple, or Google, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been using Uphold since 2017. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. Right now, they're running a great promo that when you sign up and you uh, spend $600, you can get $50 in Bitcoin for free. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. All right, my friends, I got some big updates about the podcast and the channel. First, my Thinking Crypto NFT collection, which is minted on the XRP ledger, will be released soon uh, in the next coming weeks. Uh, it will have utility, as I've been uh, hinting at. It will unlock experiences and exclusive perks for the holders. So more details to come on that. So stay tuned. And uh, I will be starting a new series on the podcast, which is titled Crypto Water Cooler. And my co-host will be Vanessa Vargas, who's the founder and host of the Unraveling Crypto uh, podcast. And we're going to have a more laid back conversation about what's happening in the market. So it will bring more content diversity and variety for you guys if you choose to listen to that or you know just the news recaps. I know some folks just listen for the interviews. So it's just to cater to different audiences. And, you know, we're going to have more of a conversation, more laid back versus the short, uh, quick and dirty on the news. And, uh, you know, we'll go more into different topics and talk about, you know, the funny things that are happening in the crypto market, the crazy stuff and and all that. So just an update, guys, uh, trying to work on building out the, the channel and the podcast. And, you know, I appreciate all of you and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't say thank you enough because there would be no uh, channel or podcast without you, uh, who are the listeners, the followers, the, the viewers, and so forth. So thank you so much. Now, let's jump into some news. Well, Jim Cramer is at it again, my friends. So today he said uh, regarding Coinbase stock, I wouldn't touch this thing at all. <laughs> so right away, everybody's like, okay, inverse Cramer, it's time to go all in on Coinbase's stock. Now, I hold some Coinbase stock. Uh, I'm certainly going to be buying some here. This is not financial or investment advice. You know, do your own research. But what we've seen time and time again, you do the inverse of Kramer and you can, you know, for the about 99% of the time, do really well. And someone even pulled up the charts for Coinbase and saying, you know, he's saying this when Coinbase is little, literally at support. <laughs> So it might break out, uh, you know, soon. You can't make this stuff up, guys. It's it's a meme now, uh, but it's so funny. You inverse trade this guy and you can do really well. Uh, you know, this, if it goes back all the way to 2008 and probably before that, remember when he was saying Bear Stearns is fine. Don't take your money out. And literally months later, Bear Stearns collapsed. And we know how that uh, the rest is history, right? Now, let's jump ahead. Um, we got some interesting charts here from one uh, analyst by the name of Matthew Hyland, and he shared three charts, one for Bitcoin, one for the DXY, which is the dollar currency index, and the NASDAQ. And he said they're all sitting at pivotal points. Appears a major macro direction is about to be chosen. So you can see here for Bitcoin on the chart, uh, you know, will it break past the resistance it's hitting right now? I think it's like 28,500 is the big resistance here. And of course, we've been tracking Bitcoin and looking for that retracement to about 40 to 50K. And as I've said many times, that's not a guarantee, right? There are macroeconomic factors out there, but the markets have been moving really well. We'll see what happens. If you look at the uh, DXY, will it bounce off of the support that it's hitting right now or will it break through? My hope is that it breaks down and, and of course, uh, Bitcoin, crypto, and other assets start to pop off, right? So it's essentially crypto and equities. The NASDAQ, similar to Bitcoin, hitting that resistance. Will it break upwards? I hope so, but uh, fingers crossed, my friends. We got to keep an eye on these charts over the next week or two weeks to see what happens. Once again, I hope the bullish scenario plays out. But there is a bearish scenario. So just be prepared for all scenarios. Um, 
And let's jump into the next item. U.S. Treasury says decentralized crypto th markets threaten national security. So, of course, this is coming from Janet Yellen. And many of you know, I spoke to a source and uh, J they told me Janet Yellen and some other folks are, uh, are really the, the big folks who are pushing the negative agenda against crypto and feeding the Biden administration, right? They, Janet Yellen doesn't like crypto and, and a bunch of other people. So she's part of that group. And she has in the past uh, come out and say uh, or said negative things about crypto. Then she kind of flipped her script a little bit when the White House um, you know, passed an executive order to study crypto and all these things. And then now it looks like they're back at it, uh, you know, fighting crypto. So let me give you some details, guys. The U.S. Treasury Department has released a press release on the 2023 DeFi Illicit Finance Risk Assessment. The report was released after a proper analysis of the decentralized finance sector. Additionally, the report speaks about how the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, cyber criminals, thieves, scammers, and ransomware attackers use DeFi services to launder and move their illicit proceeds. The Treasury has stated that the decentralized currency markets are threatening national security. Perhaps the U.S. Treasury also mentioned that it needs greater oversight against money laundering. The Treasury mentioned in the report that DeFi allows users to transact without the necessity of an intermediary. This, according to them, poses a risk of money laundering. The report also highlights measures to implement necessary assessments and actions to mitigate the risk associated with DeFi. Now, here's the thing. I, I want to be realistic. Are scammers and bad actors using crypto and DeFi to do illicit activities? Of course. The same way people right now are using cash to do uh, bad and illegal and nefarious acts, right? As we've talked about, that is part of life. Yeah, people are going to do crimes and criminals. It, this goes back to the history of human civilization, right? People are going to do bad things. The point is, though, is not to kill an innovation like we saw they tried to shut down uh, tornado cash and so forth. You can't penalize the code and, and just the innovators. You have to go after the specific bad actors and go, you know, take, take care of them versus penalizing the entire technology and innovation. Because look, whether they like it or not, DeFi is going to be the future. The world, the, the genie is out the bottle. The world is going to run on blockchains and Instead of coming out saying, oh, this is a threat to this and blah, blah, blah. No, figure out a solution how you can monitor where certain funds are coming and, and monitor the bad actors, right? And, and go after them. And there's a lot of uh, data now showing that uh, you can track some of these things because it's all on the blockchain, right? Like groups like Chainalysis and so forth, they've testified before Congress highlighting these solutions. But of course, the anti-crypto people are going to take, you know, maybe some bad activities and say, oh, you see, DeFi, crypto is used for bad activities and, and paint a broad brush, right? And try to position crypto as this uh, evil thing and it's causing all kinds of problems. And I, I hate when they do that and they sensationalize and, and when it's like literally like, hey, you and the bankers uh, nearly crashed the entire economy in 2008 and you're about to do it again with these bank runs that are happening, right? It's like, we see the full picture here. It's not crypto, but you know, unfortunately, the average Joe and Jane who are not paying attention will read these things and say, "Oh no, crypto's bad. Oh man, all of it's horrible. Wow, these these terrorists are using it. Oh no, uh, terrorists use cash <laughs> and they use other forms. The point is, you have to stop the bad actors, not the technology, and you have to. Um, yes, I understand putting guardrails in place and putting regulations in place. But it has to be balanced to not kill the technology. So, of course, uh, you know, crypto is under attack right now. We're facing massive headwinds from a lot of government agencies. And um, part of it is to slow it down so the incumbents can catch up. But there's also people like your Janet Yellens and so forth who just don't like it. And look, crypto and Bitcoin and all these things disrupt them and what their fiat money system that has been going on for hundreds of years uh, you know, they don't like that. They, they don't like that. And, and they're going to fight back. We are in the then they fight you phase. Now, Caitlin Long weighed in on this. 
statement and she said this is why biden's anti or ba biden admin's anti-crypto strategy to push crypto into the shadows makes no sense they want compliance with aml cft laws but crypto is just code so compliance can only be assured at the very connection points that they're actively choking well said she continues it's already the case that the world's 8 billion people can now create and transact in U.S. dollars with any permission or compliance screening simply by downloading and running code on their smartphone. Given that reality, what's the optimal policy to maximize compliance with AML CFT laws? Uh, it says here, it's simple, incentivize users to go through regulated access points. The same is true for the internet itself. Most users use regulated access points, i.e. Uh, lit, not dark, uh, because they're better UX uh, user experience and because they offer security services. Most people don't use Tor, even though anyone can. So those of you who don't know, Thor is like a, 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 a kind of a browser that allows you to access like the dark net, like in certain sites and so forth. It exists. Anybody can go use it. But of course, it's heavily monitored. And, and uh, it, you know, it's it, if you download the Thor browser, you're, you're, of course, putting a target on your back, but it's there. Right. But the point is the government and regulators can monitor it. So that's all. You don't ban it. Right. It, that, that would be ridiculous because you have to balance innovation, freedoms, the Constitution with um, safety and, and you know, crime prevention, and so forth. So she said, anyone can use the command line interface to make a phone call using voice over IP, but most of us use telco providers. Most of us don't run our own servers. Or we use an ISP, which is an internet service provider. But when it comes to money, Washington, D.C. policymakers apparently don't understand this basic reality. So thinking it's somehow possible to ban crypto or regulate DeFi, Washington, D.C. policymakers are mistakenly shoving it all into the shadows. But in the shadows, it's far harder to ensure compliance with AML and CFTC laws, CFT laws, I should say. The optimal policy response is similar to the optimal policy used by the Clinton administration for the internet itself. First, incentivize people to use regulated access points, thus maximizing compliance with laws and staffing up law enforcement to focus on illegal activity in the darknet. That's how they did it with the internet. And that's how uh, the internet was able to flourish and innovators and great companies and just massive uh, uh, amounts of jobs and revenue was generated and int the internet became a big part of our lives. The same thing has to ha happen with blockchain and crypto, but uh, you know the disruption is coming very fast and as I discussed with uh, Reeve Collins, the co-founder of Tether, they're fighting so hard because uh, this time around, it's not just communication, data, and, and information that's being disrupted. It is money, movement of value, and they're fighting hard, right? Because that, that old guard, that legacy fiat system has been running rampant for a long time. They've abused it. We all know the history of money, and of course, you know they're. This is once again the the stage of where they fight us. Finally, Caitlin says it's really not that complicated. Unfortunately, it's the opposite of what the Washington D.C. policymakers are doing these days, though. Friendly reminder: when you make a decision out of fear, often you get exactly what you feared. Policymakers appear to be falling into this trap with a face palm emoji. She ends it with here. So great thoughts and uh, really well articulated here by Caitlin Long. Now, with the U.S. doing all this nonsense, crypto is moving at a rapid pace across the globe, getting adoption in many different markets and uh, established uh, countries and who see this opportunity. So here, Japan approves Web3 white paper to promote industry growth in the country. The document proposes more tax reforms, clearer accounting standards, and a DAO law. So Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party's Web3 project team has published a white paper laying out recommendations for boosting the crypto industry in the country, which in part or is part of Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's strategy of promoting technology, a project 
called Cool Japan. Yes, you heard that right. In quotation marks, Cool Japan. Uh, so while the other governments are looking to put regulation in place to protect consumers, Japan is trying to create a friendlier environment for crypto after firms began leaving for other jurisdictions because of heavy tax burdens. So looks like Japan even themselves are like, oh yeah, we well, we better we'll slow down because these companies are leaving. And it's so easy for companies, crypto companies to pick up and go different places because a majority of the work is literally online and people can work remote. So uh, it's not hard for them to move, but uh, those who force crypto companies out of the countries are going to lose out on the GDP benefits, the jobs and, and all that, right? And even tax revenue, although they shouldn't overtax, uh, you know, they should really treat these new companies and innovations uh, with with a light touch, you know, as far as a taxation standpoint to help them to grow. So the Web3 project team um, has been bypassing the usual bureaucratic processes to formulate regulatory proposals for everything from NFTs to decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs. Uh, here's a quote. The cryptocurrency industry has been driven by early adopters, but it will shift to mass adoption from now on, Akisha, if I'm saying that right, Shiozaki, a secretary general of the party's Web3 project team, said in an interview with Coindesk Japan. Folks, they get it. Notice what he said, right? Mass adoption. This technology is here to stay. As I've said many times, blockchain and crypto is the next layer on top of the internet. You know, the internet's up and running at, at, at its peak right now. Now it's going to evolve and, and the way we transact and move value and trust each other is going to improve because of blockchain. And those said blockchains, right, there's multiple ones out there. They're going to be used by different governments and businesses and private individuals. And of course, they each have a native token. And you, for the first time in history, can participate in that. You don't have to be an accredited investor you don't have to go through a hedge fund or a big investment bank. You can literally put a dollar in some of these cryptocurrencies, right? It, there's never been anything like that in the history of the world. So this thing is a massive disruption and a huge opportunity for those who are first movers um, and early adopters. So Shiozaki pointed out that major companies in Japan have started to enter the market Japanese mobile phone operator NTT Docomo pledged to invest up to 600 billion yen, which is about $4 billion, into Web3 infrastructure and large financial institutions are looking to issue stablecoins. Man, Japan, they're moving in the right direction while the US is moving in the wrong direction. But, you know, as I've said many times, crypto is a global asset class. So even the, if the United States you know, they start squeezing this industry and, and, you know, putting it through a lot of pain, companies will leave, but the assets and their prices and their values uh, will not be hindered as much because this is not a U.S. market. It's global. And other countries and other investors from other countries will put money into it. And it's all in the blockchain and you have the scarcity aspect. So uh, the U.S., I don't know what the hell is happening here, but, you know, hopefully they, they turn it around and they get it right. I think as uh, you know, crypto companies start to lobby, and then you know we see news of them leaving. It'll put pressure on on uh, the government. Now, India is targeting one million CBDC users in three months, prioritizing offline transfers. This is according to sources. Around one hundred thousand users have participated in the country's central bank digital currency pilot since it kicked off in December. Folks, the token economy is coming. CBDCs are a big part of it. You know, I've said many times, CBDCs are bullish for this crypto market. It will introduce people to tokenization, the blockchain, which will break down the educational barrier that many who don't trust crypto and blockchain, who don't understand it, will eventually trust it and understand it because the government's going to educate them about it. And uh, it will just make the on-ramp into crypto much easier. However, the issue, which you know, I've talked about it ad nauseum, will they respect our right to privacy? And you know, here I can only speak for the United States with the U.S. Constitution and what we've seen with the Patriot Act and and, and the NSA and so forth. 
you know, uh, we've seen you give the government any l- level of power and they will abuse it. Um, so that's what my concern is. Will they track everything that we're buying and selling? Not that I have anything to hide, but I don't want, okay, I went and bought something from this store and this place, all that stuff to be used and it's stored and maybe used against me, right? Uh, once again, we've seen it historically. You give a little bit of, of power um, and they will abuse it. And and it may not happen, you know, in five years from now, it may happen literally 15 years from now. And, you know, something will come up and they'll use that and pull that lever to control your money. Uh, if you don't think that is possible, then you don't understand human psychology and, and history. You got to go back in history and look at the abuse of power, right? Uh, it ha- has happened on so many levels. So I'm concerned about that. And and will this lead to some draconian future? And once again, I'm not saying t- not tomorrow or next year, but it could literally be when my daughter becomes an adult, right? Will she encounter that where if she doesn't support a certain political party or she doesn't like what the government's doing and she tweets something, oh, this really sucks, right? And and they're monitoring all that data and taking and saying, oh, this person, this is their profile. We don't like what they're doing and saying, well, let's cut off, right? That is possible in a world of CBDCs because they can program the fiat currency on the on the blockchain. That's not fear mongering. That's not conspiracy theory. That's possible once you understand how this technology works. And they're going to introduce it to people. And those who don't know better are going to be like, yeah, give it to me. I get my instant stimulus payments. I get my instant, I don't know, welfare or whatever government support check or something. And, and, and you know, it, it's not just that. I'm just giving an example. But, you know, CBDCs are going to be flowing throughout the economy. So uh, this is a concern, folks. Um, and this is why we have to continue to uh, ha- hold our representatives accountable and, and the government accountable and see what they do here. We got to put the pressure. So India's retail central bank digital currency, the CBDCR, uh, architects are aiming to scale the user base of the digital rupee to 1 million users and have prioritized solving the challenge of creating an offline version to people familiar with the matter toll coin does. Although the RBI official is publicly stated in March They are aiming for 500,000 users by July. They are privately looking to double that amount. Here's a quote. Given India's population as the world's largest, we expect to reach the milestone of 1 million users easily, one person said, adding that the tentative timeline for reaching 1 million users is three months. Folks, this is inevitable. It's coming. Every major government in the world will have a CBDC, once again, bullish for the token economy and crypto, uh, very sketchy and concerning for our rights, right? Our human rights and things like that. So uh, it's something to keep keep an eye on. But you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to paint a scary feature or something. I'm just looking at the possibility of these things happening. And you know, the one good thing is that at least we have alternatives. We have Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP. We have these other cryptos out there, and um, the genie's out the bottle that. If if the government was to even try to stop any of these one blockchains or few blockchains, guess what? Somebody can go create a new <laughs> a new Bitcoin or something, right? The the, the technologies out there, the uh, know how of how to do these things are out there. So we have options. Now, finally, we got some Avalanche news. And as you all know, AVAX is the native token of the Avalanche blockchain. So Avalanche's Cortina upgrade goes live on Protocol's testnet, AVAX token rallies. The change improves support for exchanges and may bring faster development, Avalanche says. Now, I I have like a few AVAX tokens. Uh, When I say few, I don't mean like literally three, but it's a small amount. I, I'm I'm looking. I'm still, you know, not on the fence a little bit about Avalanche, and I don't want to spread myself too thin when it comes to my portfolio. But look, the, Amazon, I think, is the web services they partner with Avalanche, so that's a big adoption item there. So I'm looking, and and I may add more. But just being transparent, with you guys, I'm sure some of you probably hold a good amount. But you know, it's good to see things are progressing with Avalanche. Those, so I may. You know, I'll let you guys know if I expand my holdings here. So Cortina makes it easier for exchanges to support Avalanche's X chain, which is or which the protocol uses to send and receive funds. The upgrade will also enable faster development among benefits 
according to Avalanche. Cortina isn't the only news in Avalanche's ecosystem this week. Avalanche also released Evergreen Subnets, a series of tools designed for financial institutions. So really great to see building happening, right? If you're investing in a project, are they getting partnerships? Are developers building on them? Are they continuing to improve the blockchain, upgrades, whatever it may be, uh, you know, adding support for different te uh, uh, technologies, apps, uh, interoperability with all their blockchains and so forth. So good to see, uh, you know, things are moving ahead here. And if you guys hold the AVAX token, you know, I would love to know, leave your thoughts and comments below. Um, you know, I, I once, once again, I don't have much, but I may look to, you know, buy the dip um, and, and continue to build my holdings there. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think about the news and I will talk to you all later.